We are very glad that you're joining us. This Green Breakfast is going to be recorded. It's actually recording now, and it's going to be posted to Facebook, YouTube, and the district's website. And we'll be sure to send the link to that through our um, social media channels, as well as through the Green Breakfast listserv so that you can go back and review anything that you wanted to from today's meeting. So we are going to be taking most of our questions and sharing our events at the end of the program. And of course, with any district sponsored event, please be patient and respectful and have some fun. Like most things that we talk about, salt management is a very multifaceted program and idea. There's a lot of different things to consider when it comes to salt management and most things that we talk about here at Green Breakfast. So if you have a difference in opinion, or if you're confused about something, let's all just be really respectful of everybody's time and make sure that we are being patient with all of our speakers and with each other, giving each other some space. And of course, have fun. That is what this is all about, getting together and learning about the community and having some fun. So for those of you who are just joining, my name is Ashley. I'm the Conservation Education Specialist at the Soil and Water Conservation District. I'll be your MC for today. But I'd also like to introduce our guest speaker, who is um, Marty Hurd, who is the MS4 Program Coordinator at the Fairfax County Stormwater Planning Division. So I am going to let Marty introduce himself. I didn't have um, a really nice photo of Marty to share, so you can actually make little people in PowerPoint now. So I made a little Marty so that he can talk about himself and some of his interesting hobbies. So from here, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing so that he can, and I can answer any questions that pop up in the chat. Thank you very much, Ashley. Are you all able to see my presentation now? And can you hear me? Yes, yeah, I can. All right, great, thanks. As Ashley mentioned, my name is Marty Hurd. I've been with the Department of Public Works and Environmental Services since 2017. Uh, prior to that, I've been in the um, water quality arena as a biologist, um, a pollution uh, control specialist, and um, it's been an interesting career. It's working in the private sector for local governments, as well as the states. I work for the state of Maryland, and uh, I've also supported the EPA and other federal agencies for some of their environmental monitoring programs. But I'm here today to talk about the county's uh, adoption of the Northern Virginia Salt Management Strategy. It's a very timely presentation, considering the weather that we have today. I'd like to just give a brief overline or outline of the presentation that I'll be giving today. As Ashley mentioned, as we move through these topics, feel free to post a question into the chat if I'm able to see it and respond to it while we're on a particular slide. I will do that. If I miss it, I promise we'll come back to your questions at the end of the presentation. So thank you for that. Stormwater Planning Division, um, it has a focus on protecting our water quality of our streams from stormwater uh, pollution primarily. And one of the important takeaways, I, I would expect this audience is probably a little more knowledgeable. Uh, we're very interested in environmental issues and awareness, but a lot of people don't realize that Rain and stormwater that enters the storm sewer is discharged directly to our streams and eventually the rivers and here, eventually the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, when we water goes down our drains or our sinks and uh, toilets in our house, that goes to a wastewater treatment facility. Uh, and that water is treated before being discharged into our streams. And that's the real difference between stormwater. Stormwater is conveyed uh, without treatment, usually directly into our streets. How did we get here in terms of discussing salt and stormwater as a topic? Uh, I thought it would be good to take a step back and just review the process. Um, the Clean Water Act requires states to identify uh, waters in the state that are impaired for 
for beneficial uses of those water bodies. This, the state, the DEQ in this instance, does have a statewide water quality monitoring program. And every two years, they update a list of impaired waters throughout the state. They then set a uh, prioritized goal of identifying the stressors for those impaired streams. And then when possible to have a total maximum daily load study or TMDL conducted to determine how much of this uh, particular pollutant is affecting the streams and to work out a pollution diet to really minimize and address that pollution. The state then develops an implementation plan to address it. And as part of that plan works with municipalities like Fairfax County, the other towns and cities in the county like Herndon, Vienna and Fairfax City to um, develop our own action plans. The Department of Transportation in this case is also a big player. And together we all work on addressing those issues in our own ways, which the state kind of rolls up to evaluate if we're being effective and actually addressing those issues. Today we're talking about the Akatink Creek and salt issues, but Akatink Creek has other t total maximum daily loads that have been developed for sediment, bacteria, nutrients, uh, because we're in the Chesapeake Bay watershed that include nitrogen and phosphorus and sodium chloride or chloride uh, that can be attached to other ions. And I'll talk about that later on. It's our winter operations when we put anti or de-icers onto our streets and walkways eventually do wash and runoff into the storm drain. So we need to make sure that the application rates that we're putting down aren't adversely affecting water quality in our streams. See from this graph, this is a national study that was done by the Salt Institute that really shows that through time since uh, the 40s, salt has been uh, increased in our usage when we are treating our roadways to make them safer. And this does pose a challenge potentially for the entities that manage our drinking water because of this salt will eventually run off into our streams, rivers, and reservoirs. So the county recognized early on that these trends in salt usage were starting to impact the drinking water uh, intakes at the Occoquan and galvanized us to be proactive and get ahead of this issue before the increasing levels really become human health issues. At this moment, they're not, but if the sodium levels in our tap water continue to increase, we will start to get close to some thresholds that could impact human health. So that's another reason why this is important. Showing right now a picture of the 95 traffic that happened last month, which made national news because motorists were trapped on the highway for 15 to 24 hours in some cases. And salt really can be effective at managing and maintaining public safety and keeping our roadways safe to minimize these kinds of events, but it's really a challenge. It can be difficult to get out there ahead of the storm, uh, make sure that these areas are being treated appropriately to maintain that public safety component. I wanted to highlight too that, of course, salt, while being beneficial to maintaining public safety, there are effects on the environment. And it only takes one teaspoon of salt to contaminate five gallons of fresh water. So if you can imagine when we're putting down potentially tons of salt on our roadways and sidewalks that if we are not being effective and efficient in our salt usage, excess salt is going to be detrimental 
to not just our aquatic environments, but also uh, concentrations can go up in soil. They can affect vegetation, fish, and other macro invertebrates. In addition to the environment, salt can have a corrosive impact on our infrastructure, on our sidewalks, our roads, our bridges, and highways, also on our vehicles and other equipment because of its corrosive nature. So a question about the amounts of, side of salt that are useful to treat these uh, different surfaces. And I will talk about that further on in the presentation. Thanks for that question. The state convened a, uh, a group of stakeholders to develop a salt management strategy for the area because we recognize that this affects a lot more than just Akatink Creek, that uh, road salts are used throughout the metropolitan area across the country, honestly. And the stakeholders were gathered together to develop a coordinated approach to how to deal with this issue. The strategy provide an a la carte uh, selection of practices and strategies that we can use to communicate and dial down and really target that effective use of salt to make sure that we're minimizing the pollution aspects and also to, to strategize and monitor so that we can confirm that our strategies are having the impacts in the directions that we really want to be going. I mentioned this, there were a lot of stakeholders involved, not just the state, we also had federal participation, the localities, the community was involved. We wanted to get all voices included because this is a, uh, an issue that affects all of us. It's, it's public safety, it's lifestyle, it's the environment. And we wanted to make sure that we had that broad approach that captured a lot of input from all of our different stakeholders. And in Fairfax County, I just wanted to point out that um, there are a lot of different operators out there that are putting rock salt and other de-icing, anti-icing agents down onto the sidewalk. So that's why this coordinated approach is so important. But to now start talking about Fairfax County's efforts to implement the salt management strategy and Part of that was using best practices in the industry and upgrades of facility and equipment was a, a key part of that. Right now I'm, I'm showing salt domes. We had two salt domes recently constructed and there's one more in the works. And why are salt domes important or how do they help? Well, we're keeping the product, the de-icing chemicals stored under a permanent um, cover so they're not exposed to the elements and we're able to coordinate distribution of these materials from these larger sites instead of having multiple distributed locations throughout the county where schools parks and public services can get access to that material so it's much easier to control the um, chemicals and manage them efficiently in these salt domes we've also invested in bucket loader scales, for instance, to, to get a better measurements of how much salt we're using on an activation level, and also surface temperature recorders that allow us to efficiently target when to use these chemicals and these products because their, their effectiveness is really affected by the surface temperature of the roads. But to also share um, communication is a big part of the salt management strategy and it's important to communicate the goals of the county we want to make our uh, roads safe for pedestrians and motorists motorists we want to be effective we have emergency services that are going to be active during these winter events and we want to make sure that the roads are passable and 
the safety is being maintained. These are our high level policy objectives, but when we're talking about level of service, we want our goals or our objectives to be measurable and so that we can have some accountability here. It's important to communicate the level of service throughout all levels of our organization to residents as well as leadership, the Board of Supervisors, so that we know how different facilities are going to be managed during a snow event. And you'll see that our operators classify our facilities in four priority levels. And those priority um, facilities have different expectations for treatment. And that expectation varies depending on the size and duration of the event. And it's another clarification I'd like to make here is that in Fairfax County, the Department of Public Works and Environmental Services is responsible really for maintaining our county owned and operated facilities. The Virginia Department of Transportation treats most of the roads and highways that you're gonna see there. Those aren't really gonna be county operators out there. And as I mentioned, there are privately managed parking lots for stores and supermarkets, shopping malls, and homeowner associations also will treat certain neighborhoods to keep those roads owned and, I mean, updated and treated. But the priority, priority levels that I'm talking about here for priority one, that's police, fire stations, mass transit facilities, emergency services, and some of the schools. Priority two would include health centers, other schools. Priority three is when we're getting down to libraries and community centers and parks and recreational facilities. So our operators are gonna focus on those key areas and work their way down to other ones to make sure that their, our facilities can be operating when the conditions. Mentioned some of our equipment upgrades, but it's not just having the equipment, it's using best management practices or BMPs to efficiently use those uh, those, those that equipment and those facilities. And I'm showing a brine truck right now, which is used for pretreatment. If you've noticed, sometimes before a storm, you'll see uh, striping along our roads. And that's when the Virginia Department of Transportation is out there deploying brine as a pretreatment facility, pretreatment practice, because the industry has known for uh, some time now that if these areas are pre-treated, we can actually minimize our use of the chemicals because there's such a small amount of the chemical in the brine that's really effective about preventing that snow from being compacted and forming ice on the road surface. That kind of treatment, pre-treatment option, isn't going to be a one-size-fits-all uh, situation. The event we're experiencing today, if you noticed early around 7 or 7.30, we had rain. The precipitation was coming down as rain. If the pre, if brine was being deployed and we expected that the storm would start as a rain event rather than a snow, a lot of those chemicals would be washed off immediately before they had a chance to really be effective. Saw some other questions about other materials other than salt, and I will try to get to that further on in the presentation. Thank you for that. Calibration and training is also a really key element to this. We wanna make sure that our operators, our supervisors and managers are trained on best practices so they know the appropriate ways, uh, appropriate application amounts. We wanna make sure our equipment is calibrated so that we're putting down the proper amounts of material. And now uh, I'm focusing right now on these trucks and our treatment of parking lots and travel ways, but there is a component of this for sidewalk treatment as well. And that was one of the earlier questions. And I will try to talk about that 
further down in the presentation as well. But making sure that we have annual training and equipment reviews is a key part of being smart with the way that we use our materials. Tracking and reporting is also a really important component of the SAMs because if you're not measuring something, it's going to be really difficult to know if your all of the investments that you're putting into using your materials is, is paying off and having uh, the effect that you're looking for. We're not just tracking salt usage and what I was trying to convey through time, we are working on a continuous improvement process. Five years ago, when salt was being identified as an issue for our waterways, we had to look at purchasing records how many, at, at a seasonal or an annual rate. How much salt did we purchase? And it was uh, looking at different years of purchase records that we really had started to get a handle on how much salt we were using. Now that we've been brought into this salt management strategy, we're focused on being, uh, we're tracking how much salt we're using at an event basis, and we're working on getting down to being able to track how much material was used at a particular facility during an event. So there's different scalable ways of looking at the salt usage. But it's also important to track and report the storm events themselves because not every event is going to be the same as we mentioned earlier. Some events are going to be shorter. The amount of snow that we're going to get is going to be variable. Some storms are going to have a larger icing component. We can have thaw and refreeze events. And when we're talking about a, a five to six hour event versus a multiple day event, all of these factors are going to tie into how much material was used and how much was needed to uh, keep the roads or our travelways safe um, so that our facilities could be accessed according to our levels of service. We're also tracking through time our ability to adopt the salt management strategy, tracking the materials, not just the materials, but our investments in equipment and our training and the way that we're rolling out our operations, improving our communication plans, making sure the message gets out and so that we can uh, tie back our efforts to the bottom line of uh, the salt that we're seeing in our waterways. Also, improving the usage of our technology by using uh, the mapping tools, the GIS uh, tools that we have available to characterize each of the facilities that we're treating. It's important to know what the areas of these parking lots and sidewalks are so that we can look at our application rates and form a budget for what is an expectation for the amount of material that's going to be needed at a particular facility. So that way we can compare it to what we're seeing during an event. How much did we use versus how much we expected to use? And when I talk about special features, you'll see that there are permeable pavers that we use in some areas to control stormwater and help it to filter into the ground. Our operators have to know where these areas are as well, because we don't want to put materials down into those because they would be uh, more likely to drain directly into the groundwater supply that way. So we're targeting where and how much of the materials that we're using and using technology to help us track that information. Salt management strategy also talked about uh, non-traditional practices. It does use contracts, uh, private uh, applicators to maintain some of our facilities, especially the park and rides throughout the county. So we have been working to update our contract language to make sure that those private applicators are being trained and that they're aware of the best management practices and they're getting up to speed with the calibration methods that we're using and they know how much we expect them to apply. Years ago, our contracts were uh, organized so that 
we would actually be paying contractors by the amount of materials that were used. If, and that sort of made sense from, if you're talking about how much materials that these contractors are using, they're gonna to need to get reimbursed for those. But we don't wanna incentivize salt usage so that the more materials that are laid down, that there would be um, a higher payment associated with that. So we're really putting language in there that talks about using the correct and efficient amount of salt rather than maximizing or encouraging salt usage. So that's another way that we're trying to um, dial down salt usage. We also have um, a stormwater uh, inspection team that goes out and looks for improper storage of salt material throughout the county. A lot of operators will take materials and store them in the back of a parking lot where they're going to be treating. And it's going to be important that those materials are covered and uh, protected from the elements so that during rain events, these materials aren't uh, dissolving and draining down into our indoor storm drains. So another thing that we're tracking through time is how often our inspectors are out addressing salt piles like this so that we can document that these activities are really making an impact and making sure that our waterways are protected. And I just saw a question about street sweeping, and that is a practice when um, that is encouraged when materials are laid down. There's sometimes a 50-50 mix of rock salt and sand that the schools in particular were using to make sure that traction um, was improved near the schools so that we didn't have a lot of slip and fall events. And the schools were uh, always having to sweep up a lot of that material afterwards. And it is also important after event, if you have excess salt laid down, that those materials are being um, collected and returned back into the salt piles or, or um, disposed of appropriately. And also for spills, when trucks are being loaded, if material falls on the side of the road, it's important for those materials to be swept up and I think this is one aspect as we see more awareness throughout the community that um, if there are excess amounts of materials lying around the sides of the road, that there will be accountability being called upon to get those materials picked up so that after these events, store further rainwater isn't going to be washing these into our storm sewers. Water quality monitoring is also a very important part of this uh, process because we want to make sure that <clears throat> we're making science-based decisions. We're increasing the amount of ions that we're monitoring. Um, I guess we talked earlier about sodium chloride as one of the materials that we're using, but other ions can be calcium chloride. Uh, we're measuring potassium and sodium as well. We're also partnering with the, the USGS, um, the Washington Metropolitan Council of Governments, and the Northern Virginia uh, Regional Commission to leverage existing monitoring networks so that we can share monitoring data and get awareness out there about where these um, monitoring efforts are being conducted. And Ashley is gonna have a presentation after this one talking about the citizen science component, which is also really important because uh, there are so many uh, citizens that can get involved and help supplement the information that's really lacking out there in many cases. Education and outreach is also a huge part of this. It's important for residents and leaders to be aware that salt is an issue. Uh, I remember sitting down at the table for a Christmas dinner and one of my relatives talked about a recent storm event and complained that there wasn't enough salt being thrown out and they they like to feel the crunch of the salt when they're walking into the supermarket and they would complain thinking that it could be a, real, a safety issue without having that material but 
turns out that in some cases we don't always need to have that amount of salt out after an event to um, maintain public safety. We can really target that salt usage um, on areas where we see thaw and refreeze or there are ice instead of to just blanket entire areas. And there was a question earlier about treating walkways uh, instead of or how are walkways treated differently than the roadways and the parking lots? We're working right now to put out some materials that help to explain to people that are treating the sidewalks, what is the appropriate amount of rock salt that's needed on a roadway? Typically in some areas you'll walk down a sidewalk and you'll just see clumps of de-icing or anti-icing agent material that has been put down and it's really um, frequently 10 to, to 20 times the amounts that's really needed on these walkways. The salt management strategy shows, there's an, a figure in the lower right hand corner of this slide that talks about the appropriate spread for um, rock salt. Really a three inch spread between the particles and you'll see here's a, a picture in the upper right hand corner where we have a lot of materials that's that are put down to prevent icing and it's really more than is appropriate so getting the awareness and the materials out there to people that are using these materials so that they know the appropriate amount is really going to be key in our future efforts we will be the county will be preparing a tmdl action plan to document all of these strategies that we're implementing we're going to continue to refine our training and our equipment upgrades. As I did mention, um, tracking is going to be important and we're going to be improving our ability to track how much salt we're using. We're working with other municipalities and other government agencies. We're reaching out to homeowners associations. We're using our social media uh, outlets to improve the message and get it out there. And we're making sure that county staff are being uh, educated and have the materials to know the appropriate amounts to be using. That's the extent of the prepared presentation that I had for today. I've put my contact information on the screen. Please take a minute to take down uh, my phone number and email address. I'm happy to address questions at this time. Uh, because I did see a bunch in the chat, but in many cases they were coming a little bit too fast for me to really read and address during the presentation. So how about if I stop sharing and now we take a look at some of those questions and take additional questions from participants. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for that presentation. That was great. Um, just like Pete said in the chat, very informative on a very challenging issue. Um, I did take notes on some of the questions. I think you were able to address some of those. If there's any additional questions, please feel free to enter those in the chat. It seems like um, one that came up was issues about, um, one was progressive salting. What are the issues of progressive salting? For example, salting roads in the mountains next to small creeks, then roads next to small rivers flowing into the North Fork of the Shenandoah, then next to the Shenandoah, and finally next to the Potomac. Sure, well, that's a, a great question. And of course, um, when we do put materials down, we do look for environmental environmentally sensitive areas, especially um, proximity to waterways is a key aspect of that and the storm drains as well. Um, and we do have the ability to, um, I showed a screenshot of a facility that identified our parking lots and areas. We do have the ability to overlay environmentally sensitive areas in that GIS so that we can identify those features like permeable pavers and other sensitive vegetation vegetative areas or waterways near there so that operators can be very aware of the proximity to those resources. But that is a great comment. Um, those particular areas that you're mentioning are, are areas where 
uh, Fairfax County is not putting materials down. We do work with the Virginia Department of Transportation, and I believe they have a website that has uh, the ability for residents to contact the Department of Transportation with questions or issues they see on locations, because they also have maintenance crews that are able to go out and address some of these issues. Uh, the Fairfax County Department of Public Works also has a website where residents have the ability to uh, fill out a form and submit um, any stormwater pollution concerns that they have, identifying the areas, give us an address, uh, attach a photograph. We can get a stormwater inspector out there to address the situation. Thank you. And then we had something come up about sidewalks and roads and then the different ways that they're managed. Uh, one question was that someone noticed that sidewalks and bike lanes are cleared less quickly than the main road, and they wanted to know if that was by policy. Well, again, it's really going to be um, location specific. The county facilities that we treat do have a walkway prioritization level, and our level of service identifies priority walkways are near handicap services, near the doors and uh, exits to our facilities to make sure that it's safe for people to enter and exit our buildings. And after those priority uh, access points are addressed, the team will spread out and do the other sidewalks that connect and allow you know, further walkway transit from further sections of parking lots to the facilities as well. So yeah, there every level of service should include and clearly communicate the level of prioritization that we're gonna be using to clear these walkways and keep them safe. Thank you. And someone else used a term that I hadn't heard before, but I understand the term road diet. So someone said that they feel like implementing a road diet would go a long way towards reducing the use of salt because less asphalt means less surface to salt. And to what extent would road diets be considered? Well, that is a great question. Um, and if I understand it correctly, it's about putting new roads into place and or, or having Sure, the amount of imperviousness that we have no, is no, going no, to... no new roads. Road diets are about narrowing existing roads, the better to discourage people from driving in the first place. Uh, yes, that is a great question. And that is kind of um, uh, oof, a little bit out of my area of expertise. It seems like more of a zoning and uh, I guess a county planning access operation and it makes sense uh, but we do live in a built-up area it seems like a lot of the trends in in this area specifically have been to widen roads instead of to invest in public transportation and those are issues that are addressed with your representatives and throughout your your county you know governments to to make everyone's voice heard and i agree that you know, encouraging public transportation and bike lanes is a really great way to to achieve a lot of our sustainability goals, a lot of our resilience goals, because increasing the amounts of impervious surfaces is just going to increase the rate and the amount at which the stormwater is going to be able to flow into our streams. So slowing that down and minimizing it should be a, a key strategy to kind of reducing and, and minimizing these pollution efforts. So that is a great comment. Really tough social issue to address, societal issue really there. Thank you. Yeah, as we're seeing, this is a really complex discussion. We have some questions that um, would maybe be better directed to someone in zoning or planning, but Marty, we really appreciate you trying to answer all the questions that you can. A question actually came up from Don, and Don, if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself and asking that question because you used an acronym I'm not quite familiar with, but your question was about other substances that could be used. Sure. Um, Marty, I was just uh, asking about if there was any serious discussion 
um, on other substances other than rock salt. I know in certain, you mentioned environmentally sensitive areas, and I know in one area in the county where we had <clears throat> an infrastructure that really couldn't take rock salt due to due to its, uh, it was a parking garage, and we used unique materials, but they were really expensive. CMA is calcium magnesium acetate, <clears throat> and uh, and urea is another is another product, and they don't do the same thing. But um, I just oh no no okay bad bad word okay do do tell. Well, let's uh, I'll, I'll back up and I'll say that the salt management strategy and the county uh, did investigate all kinds of um, anti and de-icing chemicals and. Uh, treatment options, even using organic brines and CMA or um, is one of the tools in our toolbox. It is used, as you mentioned, on some uh, of our parking garages that can't really, uh, that are designed in a way that rock salt is too corrosive. But these agents all have different um, properties that make them effective during, under different conditions at different temperatures and they have different efficiencies. So it's a, a very complicated decision for an operator and, and we do have processes in place to evaluate what materials are appropriate to put down. It's part of the best practices and the salt management strategy has a section all about materials and the proper um, operating temperatures and efficiencies of them. The reason why I put up my uh, fingers is, as with the big no-no is that urea as a de-icing agent or fertilizers is, um, is explicitly prohibited for use, um, at least for the county, as a de-icing or anti-icing agent because um, of the uh, envir other environmental aspects. Those are products that are going to bite, I mean, they're going to have their own detrimental effects on the environment, specifically when we're talking about the Chesapeake Bay and nutrient, because a lot of those urea and fertilizers are going to increase nitrogen and um, I think associated phosphorus rates that would also wash into the waterways. Thank Thanks. you. But yeah, even um, beet juice has come up a lot as another option for using in place of a brine that's um, predominantly uh, comprised of sodium chloride. And a lot of those um, pilot efforts have been undertaken with variable rates of success. Right now, the county has not, and most of the um, uh, larger operations and municipalities are not really finding a benefit yet to, to, to bringing those things in and using them at the scale that, that we're operating at. But those, there is a section in the salt management strategy and it's set up so that it, it really is not a one size fits all recommendation. And what works for Fairfax County is going to be different from what works for the Virginia Department of Transportation. And it's gonna be different for a homeowner and a property manager everywhere. So it's really important to take a look at the areas that you're treating, um, what your level of service is, uh, what materials you can, um, can afford to use, uh, which ones have the best uh, efficiency and benefit for the environment, and make sure that we're just not over applying. If there's one message that I can leave you with today, it's that um, these anti-icing agents are with us. They're going to be a really important part of maintaining public safety. But the key factor is to use the proper and recommended amount. And right now, I think we're seeing excessive usage. And that's what's causing the majority of the problems we're seeing in the environment. If we can dial that usage of these materials down and get everyone on board with using the proper amount, then I think we'll see some real benefits in the short term. Thank you so much, Marty. This is a really great transition to 
the next portion of the presentation because as Marty mentioned, it's really important to measure and compare both the value of safety to the public, but also protection for the environment. And based on all the activity that I'm seeing in the chat, protection of the environment is very important to everyone who attends our green breakfast. Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. have a lot of different ideas for how we can do that. There were also mm -hmm. some comments about how do we know if our local streams have salt in them or what can we do as individuals? So I get mm -hmm. to jump in with a really, really short mini presentation about that. Before I do that, Marty, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Sure, before I go, I did see one other question that I think is a great one, and it was what what do I do and how do I treat my walkways or my driveways um, and keep my family safe? And I actually, I don't use de-icing agents. I think um, for me, I, I can get out there and shovel my surfaces. If I do see that there's a problem with ice, I, I will maybe do a spot treatment, but you can use bird seed as something to put on these ice that is going to provide some traction and there will be environmental benefit there. Sand is also an, another option if you want to improve traction, but it's going to be important that you, again, sweep that up and reuse it at a, at a different time. But I, I think that this uh, idea that the public and of course the, the stores are going to want to sell these materials to you and get you to be convinced that they're necessary to keep your area safe. But I think um, we just need to be smart about when we're going to be using the materials and how we use them, if we need to use them at all. But thanks. And Ashley, please do now. Um, I think, as I mentioned earlier, the citizen science component of this is going to be really important because we can't get out there and monitor every stream um, and having the information that the public is able to supplement uh, our monitoring data is, is going to be really important and useful. Great. Sounds good. I'm going to go ahead and share my presentation now. All right, let's see if I'm on the next one. Yes. So here I get to talk a little bit about community science in action with the Isaac Walton League's Winter Salt Watch Program. This was mentioned in the chat, so I see some of you are already aware of it. I wanted to share it because it's such a great resource for the community to really see what's going on with the salt in their streams. Just a bit about myself, I'm presenting on this because I'm the Conservation Education Specialist at the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District. Uh, we do encourage all of our stream monitors to engage in the Winter Salt Watch program. And we work with several different schools and, uh, age, and um, other groups to implement this and see where we can start monitoring salt in our community. I'm mostly going to be sharing what's on the Isaac Walton League's uh, Winter Salt Watch website because it's very comprehensive, but I wanted to be able to give everyone an overview of the program. If you have any questions, please ask them in the chat. I do see them popping up here on my screen and I'll try to address them as they come up. And all of these resources will be available and shared later as well. So what is the Winter Salt Watch program? The idea is to have community scientists engage in monitoring salt by taking fluoride test strips down to their local waterways and submitting them in the water and then getting a reading of the amount of fluoride. Um, you would want to test as a baseline before winter really kicks in and we start salting um, before major storm events and then after major winter storm events. And the website where you can learn more is listed here. So how Salt Watch works is you get a lovely kit just like this, courtesy of the Isaac Walton League of America. It is completely free, um, so you can just send them a request. They send one to you, and you could find any freshwater ecosystem to test. This could be a stream, a lake, a pond, anything. It can be on your property or in a locale that you really care about. You want to collect a sample of water in a clean, empty glass, making sure there's no any residue that could affect your test. And then use one of the four test strips that come in your kit. You can always request more if need be. So an example of that test strip is shown here in the image. And then you use the Water Reporter app to record your results. And then you can share your science using the SaltWatch hashtag on social media. 
There are 56 participating organizations and 26 official partners. These are our local official partners, the Four Mile Run Conservatory Foundation, Friends of Akatink Creek, Loudon Wildlife Conservancy, and Reston Association are all some of the local salt watch partners. If you're asking why Soil and Water is not one of the official partners, is because I didn't find out about this program before the season started. So for 2022, we absolutely will be a salt watch partner. So this has been going on for five seasons, and so it's really a great chance to see how things change over time. And I wanted to share some of the results that we have so far for season five of Salt Watch. That's the winter that started in 2021 and is now going into 2022. If you go to the website below, you can also explore these results. So it is a nationwide project, but this is where we've got some data so far. And you can see that some of the red dots are where we've got higher chloride concentrations. The green dots are where we have lower chloride concentrations. Zooming in on our local area, you can see that we definitely have some higher chloride levels as we get closer to DC. Also within the Reston area where they're testing there, it seems to be higher chloride levels as well. If you see an area that doesn't have a red dot, that doesn't necessarily mean that we don't have higher chloride data um, chloride levels there. It just means that we're not testing in that location. So these are some examples of what we might find. These are actually from some of our certified monitors who've been looking at their sites. So this is um, from an area that is, I believe this one is on Middle Run, I'm going to name my stream wrong, but this is from one of our stream monitors who's included their baseline salt watch reading. So this is before there had been any salting for the season, and they had recorded a relatively low level of 25 parts per million, and this is their test that they used. In comparison, this is from one of our stream monitors. This one is a long um, horse pen run, or this might be Sugarland. I think this is a little more north. I think this is Sugarland run. Um, and this was definitely a higher reading of about 232 parts per million um, chloride levels, so definitely a little higher. It's also later in the season. So it's just a good comparison of different sites and different levels. So there are a lot of recommendations from the Isaac Walton League about what things you can do to manage your own salt on your own property where you have a little bit more control. Um, making sure that you use an appropriate amount of salt, as we talked about in the last presentation. You don't need very much salt to cover a very large area. There's also an idea that you need to feel a crunch for there to be enough salt, but that's not true. You could actually use much less. And then you should make sure that you're using um, salts that are not necessarily eco-friendly or pet-friendly, but that you're reading the package and making sure that you're using what you wanted to use to de-ice your space. They also have recommendations for getting the word out and curbing salt use in your community. I won't talk about this too much, but if that is something that is important to you, this is linked here and also in the Great Breakfast follow-up, we'll make sure to include that. So you can look at some of those resources and see how you might wanna educate your local community if that's something that's important to you. This is important to us because the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District manages a very robust volunteer stream monitoring program. I work with over 500 volunteers each year monitoring different sites in Fairfax County. We have some volunteers who choose to become certified and manage their own sites. In fact, in this left image here, all three of these young women all have their own sites that they manage, um, which is really incredible. We're engaging a lot of our youth in programs like this. Uh, in the image where I am down on the ground, uh, trying to put some rocks in a net, that's with the Friends of Dyke Marsh. So we engage with a lot of friends groups as well and making sure that those who are interested in our local streams have the data that they need to be able to accurately represent them. And then in the very bottom right image, that is a monitoring during, um, actually right after all the snow had melted. So we even do a little bit of work in winter. And it's important to see how our streams are managing salt and how that could affect the aquatic benthic macroinvertebrates that we look for when we're monitoring our streams. So I've got some of my information here and some information on stream monitoring in case you are interested in engaging in that program. And then in our region, the Winter Salt Watch program is managed by Emily from the Chesapeake. Um, she is the, let me get her title right, the Chesapeake Bay Monitoring Outreach Coordinator at the Isaac Walton League and her contact information is here. I'll also make sure that I provide that to you. 
So this is just a really brief overview of this one program. There are many different programs that you can use if you're interested in engaging in community science. I think this is a really great way of taking your interest in managing salt and expanding it to the community and making sure that you're making a difference if you so wish. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing there. And I know that we've got a little bit more um, communication in the chat. We'll see if any other questions pop up. Green Breakfast is also a great opportunity to share different events that are going on in the community. So I do have some to share. Um, and I'll also add those into the chat in case we get some more questions coming in or other things to share. The Virginia Association of Soil and Water Conservation Photo Contest is open with entries due on August 1st. The theme this year is conservation moments and each applicant can submit up to 10 photos for judging and all photos must be taken within Virginia. And then finally, we have our conservation poster contest with entries due on September 30th. We're calling all student artists. We're seeking students to design posters to submit to the youth conservation, the youth poster contest. The theme for this year is healthy soil and healthy life. The contest is open to all K-12 students in Fairfax County and scouts are eligible to earn an additional poster contest patch. This year, we also have a new digital poster contest, which is open to students in grades seven to 12. So I'm gonna link all of that in the chat and if anyone else has any events to add or any additional questions, feel free to add those or to unmute yourselves and share. And we did get a question asking if we're gonna have these PowerPoint presentations available. We are going to be sharing the recording, but I'll see if I can also grab the slides and include them in a follow-up. And then I think Kathy's also got her hand up. Hi, uh, yes. Um, I would just like to encourage people with regard to the salt because um, it's mostly a lot of the roads and in the county that's the issue. And I encourage people to go to VDOT, to the website, and report when you see piles of excess salt, um, just to let them know. I think if, if, if more people say, they'll, you know, realize it, it's an issue and maybe put some more effort into that. So, thanks. All righty. Well, it seems like that's all the comments we've got for today. Thank you again for Marty and then also for Emily for joining us today because it has been fantastic to have you talk about salt. It's obviously something that's really important to everyone who attended today, and we really appreciate your time and your gift of time itself. So we really appreciate that. We've got another green breakfast coming up in May, and the special topic then is actually going to be human wildlife conflict with beavers. So very different than the topic today, and we hope to see you there as well. Thank you very much. Everybody go off into your weekend and have a good one. Recording over. Thanks, Ashley.